Well, I want to welcome back my uh, my two buddies here today to do a uh, a podcast and a video. We hope uh, on on some in, in questions that were given to Chris and myself when we presented at the AAII uh, conference on October 1. Uh, I made a presentation on the 20 things you should know about small cap value and uh, had great fun being on a panel with Christine Benz and, and uh, uh, Roger, oh man, I, I'm, I want to say Taylor, but from T. Rowe Price. I'm embarrassed. I don't remember his last name right now, but uh, uh, at some those things happen. And then Chris made a presentation on two funds for life and was uh, a part of the most popular panel, I think, uh, when I saw the numbers of participants watching uh, on factor investing. Uh, and so it was a, a wonderful day, I think, for both of us and a chance to, to uh, show the fine work that Chris has done and, and, uh, and with Daryl's help for, for me to be able to present information on small cap value that I have not been able to show. That was, uh, that was fun for me. Out of that, uh, those presentations, uh, there were people who asked questions of, the, uh, of us, but they never got to us because we ran out of time. And so we promised that we would follow up with a, a podcast uh, to answer those questions. And that's what we're here today to do. And gentlemen, uh, welcome back. We've had so many emails about how much people like having you on. So uh, making them happy today, I hope. Okay, let me, if I might, uh, take just one of these questions. And I've probably got 10 of them here. So hang on. Uh, first, uh, Chris, I've got one for you. Uh, this actually came out of my, but I think you're the better one to be able to answer this. Where can we get a list of small cap value funds? He goes on to say, I don't know that I can do the needed analysis on individual companies to make intelligent choices but appears to trust the funds to do that for him. So Chris, from your work, where wh what's the best source of information on small cap value funds? It, for people who just want an answer, I would point them to your website, paulmerriman.com and under portfolios, uh, under ETFs, we've got our best in class recommendations. And that includes the best in class as well as some alternatives. Uh, when people have a more limited selection, they might consider those. Uh, if people want to do their own research, though, I, I, I would encourage them to read the article there on how I do my analysis for best in class funds. And most of the data for that comes from uh, three different places, uh, www.portfoliovisualizer.com, uh, www.etf.com and the last one is morningstar.com and uh, those three are great resources they can help you figure out uh, you know what the funds hold what their expense ratios are what their historical performance has been and uh, and then make an informed decision and I, I would really hope that most people find more value in the learning to fish part of what we what we teach than just the recommendations because if you do a little of the work on your own you're going to be more confident in the answer and you're going to be more likely to stick with it and and as far as just the the raw list itself uh morningstar i assume has every of the uh, of the etfs would that be true of ETF.com and Portfolio Visualizer? So uh, yeah, both Morningstar and ETF.com will have uh, lists of small cap value, you know, US, international. And that's that's a good place to start if you just wanna see the, the broad selection. And if you wanna follow the, the wisdom of the crowd, it's kind of interesting to look. I, my first filter is usually assets under management. Uh, because that tells you something about what the collective set of people looking for that asset class go towards. Um, that's, that's kind of an interesting perspective. Portfolio Visualizer has a really interesting different way of looking at it, where you can look at fund factor statistics. 
And so you can go in and say, uh, you want to look at all of the mutual funds and ETFs available in the US market that have a statistically significant difference in the size exposure, a statistically different statistical, stati sorry, a statistically meaningful uh, or significant difference in the value factor. You could choose both of those. Um, and then you can filter on, you know, which one matters more to you. So uh, portfolio visualizers fun in that way in that it's just a really quick way to find out um, whether or not the, the, the attributes you're looking for are available and how many funds give you exposure to it and which funds give you the most exposure to it. Uh, it's kind of a fun toy. Yeah. And, and tool. It's a very useful tool. So um, I know the three of us have reputations for being frugal. And uh, I know I've been using the free Morningstar service uh, for uh, decades. Uh, is, have you looked at what Morningstar offers for uh, extra, at, a, at an extra cost that, that might be uh, valuable? Or have you stayed with the free service as well? Well, I think you you know I use the premium service, and I don't often log out to go back and find out what's available uh, or what the difference in the availability is. I should do that more often. Uh, the The thing I think I use the most that is available from the premium service is the ability to save a lot of different portfolios in the Morningstar X-ray. Uh, I don't know that everybody can do that. I think you can do an x-ray on a portfolio uh, for free, um, just a single one-off. But I tend to save up a bunch of the ones that we use regularly and, and revisit them periodically and look at how they're doing and uh, you know how they map out on the, the style grid uh, that Morningstar uses to describe the small... Uh, small blend and large and the uh, or or uh, small medium and large and the uh, value blend and growth yes okay great thank you and uh, Daryl I've got one here that uh, came to me and since you've had so much to do with uh, the studies we've done on distribution uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you take the first whack here it says, you are adjusting, and he's this person is referring to the distribution schedule that uh, that we shared, uh, and we shared one of dozens that we could. But uh, it says you are adjusting the income each year for cost of living, but the cumulative distributions are nominal. Uh, what looks like a very large cumulative number will be less in when adjusted for future dollar values. So I, I guess the what, what would be good is to share what the thoughts were about putting together the table in terms of the, the use of inflation adjustments on the dish. But we did not adjust the value of the uh, uh, accumulated uh, and, the, and the final numbers. Uh, in terms of the bottom line for what the heirs might have inherited at the end of the investor's life. I want to add information. Okay, so on the distribution tables, all the values that are shown are nominal dollars. So they're then year dollars. So when you look at, for example, the, the S&P 500 distribution table, um, on the right-hand side, it, it showed how much annually was distributed for, uh, for example, at a 4% withdrawal rate initially and then adjusted for inflation. So you start out in year one with $40,000, the next year it adjusts for inflation, and by the time you get 51 years later to 2020, it's up to $273,000. That's in then-year dollars based on inflation history over that 51 year period of time from 1970 to 19 to 1920 to 2020. Um, now, what that means in terms of real dollars is it's $40,000 a year every year in terms of real, uh, real dollars, what what those pieces of green paper, if you if you take green paper out anymore, um, 
for your uh, for your living expenses, what that will buy, it'll buy forty thousand dollars worth of living expenses every year. Uh, it takes two hundred and seventy three thousand dollars to do that in year fifty one, uh, and then your dollar. So the total distributions uh, in inflation adjusted dollars, for example, were almost eight million dollars, but in real dollars, it's two million forty thousand because it's fifty one years times forty thousand dollars per year. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, now, what it means in terms of the portfolio values, which are also shown in, in then year nominal dollars, for example, the S&P 500, 50-50 uh, portfolio, 50% S&P, 50% fixed income, at the end of 51 years, after having taken out $40,000 inflation adjusted dollars every year for 51 years, had a value of about $7.3 million. Okay, well, but what that really means is in terms of, of how much that would be in, in today's dollars, what would those $7.3 million buy in today's dollars? They would buy a little over a million dollars worth of stuff. It'd be about $1.5 million, 1.05, sorry, $1.05 million. Uh, so the, the, uh, the difference there is, is about a factor of, of seven. Uh, which is the cumulative inflation since, uh, since 1970. If, on the other hand, you looked at the U.S. four fund portfolio, 50-50 again, fixed in, uh, equity and fixed income, uh, that final value uh, for that portfolio is about 30 some odd million dollars, $30 million and change uh, adjusted for, uh, that's, nominal dollars. So when you go back and you adjust those for real dollars back to what they would have been like at the beginning of, of the investment uh, term in 1970, it's a little over four million, it's about $4.4 .4 million. So what does that mean? Well, it, it's, it's still a reasonably good chunk of change actually after, after you've taken withdrawals out of this, this portfolio for 51 years. Um, but what are, what, it really means to show to show me is that it's it's a factor of about four or so different between the S and P 500 50 50 and the U S four fund 50 50. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question, but maybe it gives a little background into to the dollars that are shown there. They're all nominal dollars. If you want to reduce them, uh, the distribution dollars. It's just forty thousand dollars per year. If you want to adjust the uh, portfolio value dollars year for year, you need to take out the cumulative cumulative inflation since nineteen seventy every year. And you know, I, I and I think one thing that confuses it, Daryl, is that that forty thousand dollars in nineteen seventy. Why forty thousand, and why a million dollars? Well, that was chosen. Uh, many years in the 90s was when we started doing these kinds of studies. And so we were trying to bring it up to today's values, which would be closer to a million dollars than it would be to a hundred thousand for a person coming to retirement and forty thousand dollars. But back in 1970, I think it was the household income, on average in 1970 was about $11,000, which, which means that it, it isn't, in reality, it's not a matter of 40,000 to 273,000 so much as it is maybe taking one quarter of both of those numbers. And all of a sudden it sounds more real in what we might've known during our lives, at, at least I are older than Chris. We're both willing to admit that. Uh, and he's had a very different experience as a younger man, I suspect. But the bottom line is uh, the 40,000 was a huge number in 1970. It certainly is not a huge number today. And, and that's a tricky part. And before we started this discussion, we, we talked about this a little bit because really the more important aspect of the study is for somebody who is saving for retirement and intending to in retirement to see that long-term impact of in inflation. 
what it's worth at the rest of your life. I don't think any of our kids or grandkids are going to are, are going to inflation adjust whatever pile of money we leave and say, well, I'm glad to have that to take into my future. And, uh, and so it's not as critical uh, an item as it is for the person who's actually going to be living on that. And Chris, would you add anything to that? Uh, no, I I think that all okay. that all makes sense. I, okay. I I like to think though that our listeners and I love that you used students uh, in the podcast this morning. I'd like to think that students of financial prudence are aware of inflation. They're thinking about it. And they're thinking about it what it what it means for their returns and their their future wealth and what they'll need in retirement. So I think the whole discussion is just really healthy. I have one thing to add about these tables. Um, these tables are based on 51 years of, of returns. And in that sense, all they, and, and they're in the past. Nobody's gonna live from 1970 to, 19, to 2020 again. It, I mean, you, can't, you just can't do it. But where, what's useful is that this shows a real sequence of returns that actually happened. And it doesn't really matter whether it was in 1970 or 1950 or 2012 or whenever. Uh, they started at that at, at with this particular sequence of returns and, and this particular sequence of inflation adjusted withdrawals. And this gave you a particular sequence of portfolio values. And, and that to me is what's important. The reason that a million, it, it doesn't matter whether it starts with a million dollars or $10,000 or $10 million or $100,000, it's easy to adjust that number to whatever you happen to have because the numbers multiply out but just based on what you have. And the $40,000 is nothing special. It's 4% of whatever you have to begin with. And so if you have $100,000 is $4,000 per year. So you divide all these numbers by what, 10. So, uh, and that, and and you can look at these, and this is this is the beauty of, of Craig's calculator, by the way, because you can go back and adjust your starting year and you can, you can play through different sequences of these re returns starting at different times and ending at different times. And so that, and that to me is is the beauty of that. And it sort of divorces the fact that, well, what was really going on back in 1970? Well, does that matter? Yeah, a little bit because it impacted the returns. But in the grand scheme of things, these are just sequences of returns over a 50 year. I think period. also I think it's important that that uh, that people understand why we create these tables. Uh, it isn't so that we can measure things exactly at a certain, although it might make feel, somebody feel good if they see a really big number at, uh, at the point at which they think will be the end of their uh, investing career. It really is to let people look at the small changes, what are small changes, going from a 3% distribution to 4 or 4 to 5 and also to see the differences of being 50-50 stocks and bonds and 60-40 or 40-60. These small changes, huge impact over time. And it's, it's probably one of the best learning tools that we have along with the fine tuning table, which shows all of the returns that back up this particular sequence of so it, it is um, more than just figuring out what the risk adjusted or inflation adjusted return might be. Uh, it's about those big choices that look small. And, uh, and so uh, it's one of the most important things that we do. And Daryl, I, I know we keep expanding the list of, of strategies and now we're gonna do even more next year. Uh, I really appreciate it because I think it's helpful. Yeah, I think these are the all these tables, almost everything we do, like Chris mentioned, is in the vein, primarily of teaching people how to fish, right? It, it's how do you how do you look at this data and interpret this data, you should not expect this same return sequence, you should not expect to get the same performance. It just it won't, it, 
won't be the same. Uh, but what's important is understand the differences, the choices you make uh, can have on, on the potential future outcome of your investment uh, life. Yeah, and that's super. Uh, now here's one that I get to take. And uh, the question was, are there any good to excellent small cap newsletters you would recommend? Now, differentiate this from the question that Chris was dealing with about sources of information on the uh, uh, the di different funds or ETFs. There are there are a number of places you can go and see. Uh, some sort of recommendations for the selection of ETFs. Obviously, we would love for you to think that the work that Chris does on the best in class ETFs, uh, given that you understand what we're trying to accomplish with those, we would like to see that as the equivalent of a newsletter that is trying to get you to find the right combination of asset classes. But there are more. And in some cases, it isn't about ET mutual funds. It's about the small cap companies themselves. And uh, it gave me an excuse to call one of, I think, one of the smartest people in our industry, one of the most straight shooting people in our industry, the folks that I put in the top 10 list of what I call truth tellers, people that I trust when they share information with me. And that is Mark Holbert. And Mark Holbert for decades and decades has been tracking newsletters that do everything from options uh, and, and shorter term trading to long term index approaches. He used to look at hundreds of different portfolios. That's when you were paying the price to subscribe to his newsletter. But then that kind of a business wasn't practical anymore. It, it was too much free information uh, on the internet. And so what happened was Mark changed the way that he newsletters. And that was, if you wanted him to track what you did, then uh, he would charge you to do that. And he would get the newsletter just like any other subscriber would. And then he would do the tracking. So then he source of income, but it was from the people who were providing the newsletters. Now, the downside of that is a lot of newsletters that didn't have good track records uh, dropped out and wouldn't pay the money to have their track records evaluated. Uh, they didn't look so good. So it's a much smaller list. And there's a an obvious problem with survivorship bias. But I do think that from the conversation that I had with Mark and then spending some time this morning looking over his results, go to holbertratings.com. That's H-U-L-B-E-R-T ratings.com. We'll have a link in the notes to the podcast and the video, but he shows the results of, of does of portfolios, some of them for small cap value and small cap blend companies. And there are a couple that have historically tended to float to the top. One is called Nate's Notes. I look at the, at the long-term track record. It's, it's really pretty good. As a matter of fact, let me see if I can find that. Just, just hang on for one sec. Going back over 15 years, during a period of time that the S&P 500 uh, compounded at uh, about 10.5% uh, and, and the OTC compounded at about 13, uh, Nate, uh, Nate compounded at 17.2 uh, for his aggressive portfolio and 14.6 uh, portfolio, great returns compared to all of the newsletters in, in this particular area. Another newsletter that's been around for a long time is the Cabot Turnaround Newsletter. Now that would sound like a value. Well, that, that's basically what uh, Cabot was tracking. 
there are some fascinating things that we learn about newsletters and their performance because the Cabot track record for the last 30 years is terrific. For the last 15 is terrible. And so it means the previous 15, he wasn't just terrific, he was amazing. And that, as you can imagine, would have attracted a lot of subscribers. And then as so often happens for the future, he didn't do as well. Doesn't mean that he won't do well in the future, but really as I look at all these numbers going back uh, to uh, 15 plus years, Nate appears to be the most consistent. Uh, and I, I'd never looked at Nate's notes before myself. So I took a look and I think the information is very interesting. Let me assure you, there is a huge difference between buying or investing in a mutual fund or track and their return versus buying individual securities. Because question number one, did you buy them all? Because Hulbert tracks all of the recommendations. Or did you look at Nate's list and pick out your favorite five because the minute that happens the return is going to be different did you buy it when nate originally recommended it or did you get in later after it had already gone up 20 or 30 percent all of the human aspects of investing are going to impact turn that you actually get from nate's notes or cabot's turnaround letter but it is at least as good a judgment as anybody would have in the newsletter industry, because there is nobody, at least to my knowledge, that, uh, uh, that has done this kind of work. And by the way, the one, the one thing that I, I thought was, was, was fascinating was to look at the long-term return of other asset classes going in years while the NASDAQ compounded at 13.2. The Morgan Stanley International EFA index, based on the price only, they did not in this case reflect uh, the, the dividends, which there would have been some, but the only was 1.29%. Gold was about 3.4%. And as I mentioned earlier, let's say the S&P 500, 10.4%. The Wilshire 5000, the total market index, I'm surprised, 10.4%. As we've said so many times, there are people who just love the S&P 500, others who just love the total market index. They are virtually, in terms of the impact of the largest companies, uh, virtually historically same. And the T-bill, I love this because here's a period of time, the S&P 500 compounded at better than 10 the, the, the NASDAQ better than 13, the T-bills, the riskless transaction paid less percent a year. That is a huge difference between the T-bill rate. It's normally about a 7% difference. And so it, it was a unique 15 year period. So I, I, I hope that gives you uh, anybody, you're not gonna pay anything to go look at Hulbert's work. And in some cases, he goes all the way back 30 years. All right, moving right along here. Um, Actually, Paul, can I just chime in on that one yes, for a second? Please. Yeah. You, you mentioned in the middle of it that uh, you, know, you kind of have to wonder when you're a subscriber to a, uh, a newsletter like that, whether you're going to behave in the way necessary to get the return. And I, I think for, some of our uh, our listeners they're familiar with the AAII shadow stock portfolio, which is a small value uh, collection of individual stocks. Mm -hmm. And for anybody trying to do that over time, they'll they'll also realize that there's a list of rules that you need to follow uh, when you're trading in and trading out. You want to look at uh, how liquid the asset is that day what the bid ask spread is that day. You wanna use limit orders when you buy and sell. Um, you, you know, it's, it, it, a lot of times we're very cheap when we look at the funds and we say, why should I have to pay another three basis points? But when you look at something like the shadow stock portfolio 
or what it takes to follow one of these newsletters and get the return that um, you know is theoretically possible, there is some work. There's a fair amount of work that goes into it. And I, I think it's important for listeners to appreciate that and to remember that uh, that expense ratio isn't all wasted. Some of it is actually buying you some meaningful service and some value that's helpful and saves you a lot of time and headache. You know, I'm glad you brought up AAII. Um, if you do a search for articles on AAII's journal in the journal, they've done a ton of work on small cap investing and a lot of uh, portfolios that they, that they have uh, created. <clears throat> I really want to encourage you, if you have not uh, ever seen their journal and seen and followed their services, you can subscribe for a month dollars and get an idea of uh, what they have available. For $3 for a month, you get the premium service there and you can dig even deeper. And by the way, I think they, they, they charge for a year under thirty dollars a year, and uh, it is a nonprofit organization. They do a marvelous job in educating uh, folks, uh, but you will get exposed to some of the brightest people who are trying to help do it yourself first. They are not in Wall Street trying to figure out how to get you to put money in Wall Street. They are folks that are trying to help you take better care of these decisions on your own. And uh, so they're a, I just think they're a great, and, and, I, and I mentioned this uh, in one of my presentations at AAII when I was poking around on the, their website uh, in preparation for my presentation, I noticed that I could go to the Arizona, um, I don't know if it was uh, Scottsdale or Phoenix, but it was the Arizona AAII chapter. And there was Mark Holbert speaking for uh, two, two and a half hours. I love his presentation. I, I don't mind uh, two and a half hours of Mark Holbert. But if you are on your toes and you want to learn from people who are speaking to AA chapters all around the country, you go to a list of their chapter meetings, and they've been letting people free. I don't know if they're ever always going to let them in free, but right now, a lot of folks, you can get in and see these, these really smart people sharing what they know. So yeah, AAII, two bucks, three bucks, um, probably, I hope you do it longer. Okay, let me look here at the, oh, here's a, here's a really an easy one. And that is how do we get the PDF version of We Are Talking Millions? And in that, you just go to paulmerriman.com slash sign up. All one word, sign up. And you then will have access uh, to the free book. Now, Chris's book, and by the way, Chris, congratulations. I, I see that the reviews on your new book are just super. And I don't, they may all be uh, uh, relatives of yours, maybe, but I don't think so. I, think <laughs> I don't think people, so. I don't, I don't know that any of my relatives have read it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's what happens. Relatives never read this stuff. I'm still trying to get my wife to read it. Anyway, um, I really do uh, was really happy to see how people felt about your book. It is not a free book, but it is, I think, 1995. All the proceeds that Amazon doesn't keep uh, go to the foundation. Uh, Chris has donated those. And, well, and it's uh, 995 for the ebook, oh, uh, right. 1995 for the print book. And like you said, all profit goes to the foundation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and there's a question here, considering the large and small cap US and international uh, ETFs, what are the ETFs or funds you are using for the money you have invested in on? Uh, and so I'll tell you what I own and how I own it. I 
was part of an investment advisory firm that that had my name on it. And I did that for 30 years. Then I sold the, but the firm still manages uh, the money that, that, uh, that I have and my kids and uh, almost everybody in the family is having them manage the money for them. So I, I, in essence, do what they say to do because they do. And in that portfolio, uh, I have in terms of the buy and hold portfolio, a combination of DFA funds that I've held in many cases for a long, long time, and also some Avantis funds that are sitting, uh, as you know, in the recommend the portfolios that we recommend. But it turns out that the old Merriman firm recommends Avantis in many cases as well. And so uh, I'm I'm not doing anything special that somebody else couldn't do either by following Chris. And I think this is important. I have been, ever since I went to the first two or three day event to learn about DFA funds uh, at the home office in California, uh, I have been a real advocate for their family of funds. Now in those days, there was nobody else that had what they had. Today, there are more outlets for those kinds of strategies. Certainly, the Avantis people are folks that used to be at DFA who now have put together a family of ETFs uh, that, that will emulate very similar kinds of portfolios as to what DFA has done. But the goal of what Chris has, and Chris, you're going to correct me if I'm wrong on this, is to do our best to, in essence, emulate the work that DFA created in, in, in building funds and now ETFs that access these different asset classes. And if we could, it would be great if we could help people get DFA returns, or let's call it DFA-like returns, or better, and not have to pay a penny in advisory fees. And that's what a do-it-yourself investor is trying to do. I don't know that they all do it because it's fun. I think they do it because they don't have to pay somebody else to do it for them. Now, Chris, give me the feedback. Have I in any way misrepresented or stated uh, what it is you're trying to do? No, that was that was perfect. I, I you know, uh, when we first started the work on the best in class funds, I think uh, it was aspirational to try and build a portfolio that would be as uh, tilted towards small in value for a similar kind of expense ratio with the diversification across as many companies as DFA provided. And over time, as we've gotten more fund choices, I think we've we've gotten uh, to where we can uh, we can we can do pretty much everything they can. Sometimes um, the funds don't have the diversification I would like in terms of the number of companies, but that improves with every year. With every year, we get more selection and uh, more opportunities to to do. And DFA themselves are starting to make their funds available as ETFs that people can buy, and they will be part of our future uh, evaluation set. Uh, so far, they haven't provided the funds that map perfectly to uh, your portfolio, the ultimate buy and hold or the four fund. So that makes it a little bit tricky, but we'll keep watching that space and and keep trying to do the best we can. Um, I don't know if it did. I don't know if this listener wanted us all to answer the question of what we use for so our small cap you value. Just, uh, you just offered. Come on, man. Let's, okay. All right. Let's so go ahead. So. I think of myself as a um, a patient and prudent investor. So when I first started working uh, with the Merriman organization and started thinking about tilting towards small and value, I adopted some of the fund choices that we recommended as part of our best in class at that point in time. And over time, 
as uh, we've evolved the recommendations, I've left some of those holdings in place and added some of the new ones, partly out of tax concerns, just not one, it, and partly out of kind of a fundamental behavioral belief that my portfolio is like a bar of soap. The more I touch it, the smaller it gets. And so I, you know, I, I tend to not mess with it unless I think there's a really good reason. And I always try and call that out when we update the best in class recommendations. People shouldn't just blindly change everything. They should think carefully about the tax consequences of changes and their confidence in the benefits of the recommendation versus the cost of switching. You know, you pay a bid ask spread on an ETF every time you trade it. So um, people, I, I think it's good to try to optimize but it's also good to be patient and uh, to take things slowly. And I don't mind that I have a little more complexity because of it, but I, I probably hold some of all of the funds that we have recommended as part of the best in class in small cap value over the last several years, just because I'm patient. Yeah. I have to ask uh, when you find a fund that you think or ETF that's going to do better, for whatever reason, size, value, quality, profitability, whatever it is, how much extra return at a minimum do you want to get in order to justify adding that ETF? It's a good question. Um, I'd like to think that it, it's going to be at least multiple tenths of a percent better than the prior recommendation because there's so much noise in the process. Uh, so, you know, if if the other thing is I look at the portfolio as a whole, though, and I look at the impact of the fund change on the portfolio as a whole. So if it lowers the expense ratio and maintains the expected return, that to, that to me is like a guaranteed part of the return in the lower expense ratio for the same expected return. That that might nudge me. I, I might even take that at you know uh, tenths of a uh, tenths of a tenth or hundredths of a basis point difference in expense. So uh, it kind of depends on where it comes and you know if it if it had the same return but a greater number of companies that might nudge me in the direction. So uh, this stuff. I, the thing I try to emphasize when people ask questions about whether they should switch or not is that the fundamental choice is how much you're going to put in these different asset classes. It's far less important which fund you choose and once you've decided you're going to do small cap value. Yeah, you want to do the best you can, but that is very much a secondary impact on your long term return compared to deciding to have 10% or 20% in small cap value or, or 5%. That's, that's the first order thing you really need to get right. And how much you're going to have in equity and how much you're going to have in fixed income. That's a really important decision. Those are the biggies. Yeah. And then which fund you're in, eh, you know, it's good to get it right or, or to do the best you can, but you don't really know which one is going to do the best anyway. So um, don't but, don't lose but, sleep at night but, over but that. Chris, okay, but would it be fair to say that uh, a small cap value fund that has an average size company of two billion dollars versus another has an average size company of six billion dollars, there is likely going to be a significant difference. Now, it significant can be that one tenth or two or three tenths. Wouldn't you go with the two billion rather than the six billion in your I, portfolio? I, yeah, I would. I would, but I would also say that uh, you know, uh, it's uh, in any given year that that change could go either way. Yeah, yeah. So you know, if you decide to be patient about it to wait a year because you want long-term capital gains instead of short-term capital gains on it, that's probably the right decision because the difference in the taxes could swamp the difference in the expected return. Right. Uh, right. So there's, there's advantages to being patient and there's advantages to optimizing the portfolio. And you have to, and there's advantages to being invested in a way that you can stick with, right? So you have to figure out those three things together for you personally, and it's a very personal thing. Yeah. Yep. Now, you're on the hot seat. You don't have to say a thing. We didn't clear this, but 
you want to talk at all about your about your own approach? So, probably two decades ago, um, we, my wife and I, ended up putting money with Paul's firm, some some of our portfolio, um, but because I like to diversify, I kept the reasonable chunk myself, right? So, but they were both invested in primarily the same way, which is the small, large growth value U.S. international. Um, and because I'm a buy and hold investor, it beats the heck out of me what the specific funds they're in, uh, that they're in now, because I don't look at it to speak of in terms of trying to decide which fund should I do, should I move one way or the other. So I don't, I don't pay a lot of attention to that because I think I'm invested in the right asset classes and the right, the right geographic diversity. And so I don't worry about that. Plus, as Chris mentioned, there are many, when you, when you start messing with your portfolio, there are many things to consider. And, and one of them is being a, a retired engineer is that in, in, in work life, you often realize that, that the better is the enemy of the good enough. And so if you have a portfolio that's good enough and you try to make it better, like Chris said, it might get smaller rather than larger. And so that's, that's, not, that's not what you want. Um, and the other thing is that, that uh, you, you should be mindful of, of the reasons why you try to change sometimes. Um, if you have $100,000 in an asset class and, you, and your expense ratio is five basis points and you have a place over here where it's only three basis points and you say, well, that's cheaper. I should go over there. Well, be careful about your gains, number one. But the other thing is, you know, okay, two base. So that, that one has 40% less expenses than, than the one you're in now. But what is that really? On a hundred thousand dollar allocation in that particular fund, it's 20 bucks a year. Yeah. yeah it does, does, deal? doesn't matter. No, yeah, no, yeah. it's not a big deal. If you're look, if on the other hand, if you if you're in a fund that has uh, a, a five basis point five basis points expense ratio, and you're thinking about moving to one that has a thirty basis points expense ratio because it's maybe a little better in terms of some of the factors or, or some of the allocations, okay, you should you might want to take a look at that one because that could be several hundred dollars a year difference going up in a higher expense ratio. So. Think about what your asset allocation is, what your expected return is, what you might likely get out of it, because nobody knows. And so those are the things to consider is whether touching it is a good thing or not. So, uh, uh, Chris, you're a, a true do-it-yourselfer. Uh, I am a true have somebody else do it. And, Daryl, you're a combination. Yeah, I'm so totally schizophrenic. You, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> when you sit down with your advisor, uh, do you work out an, an end result that has to, to, to fits for what you're doing and what they're doing? Are they seen as one portfolio? So the short answer is because my portfolio that is being managed is being managed by Paul's former company, the Merriman Company, the short answer is yes. It's looked at as a whole portfolio, even the part that they aren't managing. They consider that and they help advise me on, on, on what I might could do with that. Mm -hmm. I'm free to do with, with that what I want, obviously. Um, but my advisor is very good about that. And he's, he's, he's definitely a fiduciary. And this is not a commercial for Paul's former firm, but, but in my case, that's what they do. We look at what they're managing, what I'm managing, what's in tax deferred, what's in tax free, what's in taxable. And so a uh, case in point here, when, when uh, we recently looked at, at how we would free up some funds to go, to go purchase a new residence if we wanted to. And uh, my advisor and I sat down and we looked at this. And in some cases, it would mean selling, selling things out of their portfolio as opposed to my portfolio because it had the capital gains impacts were less. Um, and so, you know, that takes money out of their fee, but that's the right thing to do in this particular case. So, so yeah, it's short answer is it's managed as a whole. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I will move on to a, an, another question. I really enjoyed it. It is, uh, 
what are the specific four funds you recommend to hold for life? Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and I would want people to link to this for sure. Uh, Chris has done a lot of different pieces on building these portfolios and how he selects the ETFs. There's one of them that I just, I, I think it's terrific because it looks at Vanguard portfolio for four funds. Well, actually it looks at more than four funds, but you can pull out the four funds there. You can pull out the four funds from DFA. You can look at the funds uh, that would be in the old hold that, that, that we recommend, as well as all the four fund portfolios and the names of the, that's in small print, but the names of the, uh, uh, of the mutual, of the ETFs are, are right there. And uh, so it is in one place. It shows the average price to book, the average company size, the average expense ratio, the average yield, and how many companies they own in their portfolio. Just a ton. And not, by the way, one at a time, but looking as we should at the entire portfolio. So what I did when I got up early this morning, I've always got to have a project when I get up early. I wanted to look to see how has the Vanguard strategy done uh, this uh, versus the four fund US. And Chris, I don't know how often you do this yourself, but here's what I know of as of yesterday, that the Vanguard large cap blend fund, 1.8% through yesterday. The, the fund that is used in the four fund strategy uh, was up 24%, uh, 2.2 better than the S&P 500. And then we have the, uh, excuse me here, I'm now I'm getting confused by, by my old numbers, but the bottom line, the bottom line is when you add them all up, uh, there has been a substantial advantage of the four fund portfolios, US only, 29.7%, 7.9% better return than the four funds at Vanguard trying to do the same thing. Now, Chris, how can the four, I think this is important for people to understand, there is no magic here. What happened this year that our four funds that you recommended did better than the same kind of things in the ETF portfolio at Vanguard itself. Well, uh, I mean, to start with, a year a year is, uh, as we know, meaningless in terms of any historical differences in performance. But uh, not even a year. It's just that's this year. Year to date. Yesterday. Yeah, yes, year to date. Yes, even worse. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, well, the the. Uh, the Avantis funds that uh, are are the primary difference here. Uh, they do filter on quality, so that probably helped a little bit. Um, uh, the uh, the Vanguard funds are going to have lower expense ratio, but not be as small, not be as value. So uh, you know, my guess is uh, since you're catching me not having done the year analysis here that uh, that the uh, the combination of the value and smaller have done okay this year, you know that that tilt year to date has uh, has helped them out to just be a little bit more in that direction. And by the way, just in terms of people, uh, if they're looking for the information you just mentioned, if you go to the website, and you go to uh, portfolios, ETFs, uh, and then go down to uh, the best in class ETF recommendations page. That's where you can see, uh, and then scroll down. That's where you can see the way I've constructed the four fund uh, best in class portfolios using the best in class ETFs. And you can see how they occupy the Morningstar style boxes, what the price to book is, the average company size, expense ratio, et cetera. Terrific, terrific. Yeah, it's size, it's how discounted they are. 
and this year has rewarded size and more deeply discounted value. It's, it's, yep. it's happened yep. across the board, uh, even in the international markets. Okay, here's one, uh, Chris. Uh, somebody uh, wanted to know from your factor investing panel, um, there were a couple of websites that, that you mentioned, and I think you mentioned them earlier uh, today, and we'll put these in the, uh, um, in, in the narrative about the, this podcast, but those two specific websites that you mentioned, one portfolio visualizer you mentioned earlier, what was the what was the other one that you mentioned was a good place to, to, to research uh, ETFs? ETF.com. Oh, ETF. And you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. And Morningstar. Uh, and all three of them are good. Yeah. All three of them are helpful. And there was one that somebody else may have mentioned, um, or was that ETF.com? Uh, that was so an, another another place if you want to learn about uh, the value of tilting towards small in value in some nice summaries of academic papers and academic research that's done is alphaarchitect.com slash blog their blog posts yep. are quite good sometimes Larry Swedro guests on there uh, they do some really nice work, and that's alphaarchitect.com forward slash blog. Yeah. Okay, terrific. Uh, for you, if you have mostly a taxable account, will using factor investing and the need to rebalance possibly make the tax drag overwhelm the better expected gains from factor investing? Uh, one of the really interesting things about the rebalancing is that if you try to do, say, invest in small and value companies on your own, and you and you you have to rebalance every year because otherwise, over time, you might end up holding a holding a large cap blend, right? You know, the small companies that grow really well come to dominate, and so you have to rebalance and you have to do a lot of trading. One of the really slick things about doing this with funds is that that's all done for you in the background and uh, and you don't you don't have to do it. And if you do it with an ETF, they're very tax efficient about how they do it. So you're very unlikely to get a tax bill at the end of the year from capital gains. Now, over time, if you're doing like a four fund solution or a 10 fund solution, the ultimate buy and hold portfolio, you do have to do some rebalancing but it's far less than you would have to do if you were doing it with stocks and managing it all on your own. Uh, so uh, that does, you, you know, when you do the rebalancing, you're giving up a little bit of return for less volatility in returns uh, there, and you are paying a little bit of taxes on it, but if you only do it every year or so, so that you're paying ca the long-term capital gains, uh, the the tax it, tax consequences are hopefully not that bad. Yeah. Okay. And maybe you have answered this, but uh, when rebalancing annually to maintain a fixed percentage of asset blend in the two fund strategy, uh, and and uh, the target date and small cap value strategy. Do you strictly look at the end of year value of each asset and modify accordingly, or are there other metrics, uh, sub criteria, and evaluating? And is this in your book? It is in my book, and the uh, the way I do it for the back tests is at the end of year uh, we rebalance, and and then if there is a contribution or a withdrawal, it is contributed or withdrawn in a way that preserves the rebalance for the strategies that do rebalance. So uh, those who've read the book know that there are different strategies, uh, you know, some that don't have any rebalancing during accumulation, uh, some that have a rebalancing during accumulation, uh, and then nudge rebalancing during withdrawal. Uh, none of them have rebalancing during withdrawal, the way I've done it in the book. Uh, one more here about uh, Schwab account. 
rates. It said my swap account rates my portfolio on risk versus return. Is this the ultimate way to measure how I am doing? Uh, do you want me to try that one? Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I wouldn't, I would not, I would not uh, use that as the ultimate way to, to determine how you were doing. I would just use it as an indicator of how Schwab perceives you to be investing uh, relative to other investors. Uh, remember that what is risky and volatile for one investor might actually be well within the comfort zone of another investor. Mm -hmm. So I, I view that as I, I actually have a lot of my funds at Schwab and I occasionally run a portfolio check and it comes back and it tells me that my portfolio is aggressively invested. Um, and I, I but <laughs> But I also know that I can go and I can examine my portfolio using the fine tuning charts at your website and get an idea or or the back testing that I've done uh, in two funds for life and get an idea of how um, what kind of downside risk I'm exposing myself to over the last 50 years or the last 90 years and that to me is a far more meaningful piece of information than whether somebody describes it as aggressive or conservative. Uh, what I really want to do is make sure that I don't exceed my my ability to stay convicted, to stay committed, because if I invest in a way that is going to lead me down a path to freak out and sell when the market is down by a normal um, historical amount for the way I'm invested, then I've totally shot myself in the foot. Yeah, I mean, that 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 is, if I was going to say, what's the meaningful metric of risk, that's it. It's, you know, have you taken on more risk than you can handle in a historically bad market? That's a really, really important piece of information. But whether Schwab labels that as conservative or, or aggressive, that that's far less important. So, Chris, when they came Gerald, back and said you were invested aggressively, you said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, because Good idea. That's what I was going for. <laughs> right. I, because I'm, I'm trying to invest conservatively for our short to medium term needs and aggressively for the next generation, uh, you know, for the money that I expect to pass on. And so, uh, you know, if collectively they describe that as aggressive for a retiree, I'm fine with that. Yeah. But that does open a question about then I think we get an idea even from what Daryl said about the aggressiveness of that part of the portfolio that's for the long term. But how would you further describe the conservative part of the portfolio for the short term? Uh, how much in fixed income and how much in equity would you be thinking there? So we we like to have um, confidence that the next I we kind of approach it like uh, Christine Benz advocates with a, a bucket strategy, but we don't wrap ourselves around the axle of all of the details of trying to keep that perfectly allocated over time. Uh, if we can have uh, between three and seven years of uh, stable assets that we can look at, and that would be in some some form of fixed income, probably, or other safe safe assets. Uh, things that are relative, not not very volatile. Things where you're not going to lose fifty percent when the market goes down. If we can have three to seven years in assets like that, then we figure, you know, if the market goes sideways, we don't have to sell stock in a dip, and so. So that's that drives our fixed income holding. Um, and then uh, beyond that, you know, equities and equities tilted towards small in value uh, are are good engines for the future. And so that combination uh, that that's that's the way we approach it. Uh, but we also we also cross check it with uh, kind of a fine tuning table analysis and look and say, OK, given that allocation, and given the history back to 1970 or 1928, what kind of a downturn would our overall portfolio experience? And, and could we stick to our guns through that kind of a downturn? 
And uh, if the answer to that question is yes, and we've got a lot of history because we've invested for 50 years now, <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> I don't know, that's probably a slight exaggeration, but certainly 40 as adults that we can remember. So we've been through some ups and downs. We know we could tolerate those. Then, you know, if it's not gonna be worse than that, we figure we're okay, yeah. Carol, you were gonna add something, I could see it. No. No, oh, okay. That's I, if I added anything, it would be, I agree. I, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Not sure that's adding anything. And, and by the way, when, when people say that I tilt towards small and value, uh, I think some people here, I invest in small and value a lot. And, and what is the difference between tilt and a lot or all? Well, so let me start with none. Um, okay. So uh, a lot of times you'll hear Bogleheads say, well, I own the whole market. I own small and value. I'm tilted. I have some small and value. That actually represents a zero tilt to small and value, none. And the it's reason the is- that, It's what the market is. So it's, yeah. it's flat. Yeah, exactly. You own mm -hmm. enough big and growth to offset what you own in small and value. The, the only way you get some of the premium that academics have found in the small and value part of the market is to own more of it than exists naturally in the market. So that means, so to tilt a little bit, you know, if you own a total market fund and then you own 5% small cap value, you have tilted towards small and value because you now own more small and value in your portfolio than would be in the whole market. So to tilt a little, you know, 1%, 5% of your portfolio, it doesn't take much. Uh, to tilt a lot, uh, you know, I, I think 20%, 30%, anything, you know, in there and beyond is starting to get to be a lot. And the reason I say that is that uh, as you as you put those greater percentages there, uh, you run the risk over time if if you're patient with your rebalancing that they grow to be 40% or 50%. And, and along with that tilt comes a lot of volatility. Mm -hmm. So in my book, I think I only considered uh, 10, 20 and 30% as, uh, as the amount somebody in a two fund for life solution would, uh, would tilt, yeah. But you know that for what it's worth, I, I noticed that when you are at 20% small cap value, compared to owning the target date fund only, that it adds about 45% you have to live on in retirement. That is a big deal. And 20%, I don't think is a big deal risk-wise. Now you can certainly disagree with that, but that's my view. Yeah, it, 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 these can be life-changing things. So if you, if you just, uh, follow the simplest recommendation in two funds for life. And you go from uh, putting 10% of your salary into, um, and I'm, I'm hopeful people will save that much, right? But, but say people save 10% and they put it all into a target date fund, that's probably prudent. It's probably a great plan. But if they put 9% into a target date fund and 1% into small cap value, uh, that could change the amount of money they have across a lifetime by 25%. It, you know, it, it could be a huge change in what they have to spend in retirement and what they have uh, to leave to heirs. And uh, I think most people could live with that 1% that they put into a different bucket and ignore. And, and uh, so, yeah, it can make a huge difference. These little, little changes in behavior can make huge differences in results. Well, gentlemen, I think I think we've covered most of what they were uh, people had asked, and uh, I I just want to say that I so appreciate what what you are doing. We get so many nice emails about uh, people uh, all excited that they don't have to listen to me for an hour, but they get to listen to a little bit of me and a lot of you. Of you, I think probably the better. So. Uh, thanks, Chris, for what you did at uh, AAII. Again, I hope our uh, listeners will try them for one month, uh, either for their regular or their premium service for either $2 or $3.
and, uh, and find out more about the kinds of information. Remember the work that we do, at least that we're aiming to do to help you is really focused on the equity market and the fine tuning table and the distribution table. But there are so many other important investment kinds of decisions that are made that are addressed in the AAII uh, articles and literature. Uh, and so uh, I, I think it would be a wise investment. Well, thanks for all that you're doing. Uh, we've just had recently a meeting of, uh, of, of four of us to talk about uh, what we're going to do next year and the commitments we all made to, uh, to up our, our game in I think is going to be pretty doggone exciting and and Daryl you're a huge part of that so thank you both yeah. and and we'll we'll be back soon uh, to answer your questions and uh, again thanks to AAII for their generosity and, uh, and their support of us and getting our message uh, to people that's our job is to educate find more students we need students and we want to we want to be good, effective, efficient, uh, and meaningful teachers in their future. Thanks again, as always.